and welcome to another episode of Gotta Run With Will. My name is Mark Vogt. I'm your guest host today. I'm from Complete Race Solutions, a running scoring company in Staten Island. I want to thank Will and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network for inviting us here today in this beautiful studio. I would like, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest, Yasia Cinco Zorbo. Quite a mouthful, everybody. We also know her as Yasia. And welcome, Yasia. Your name is very long and beautiful, but it has an interesting background. We call you Yasia for that reason. So what is the background of your name and where are you from? I was born in uh, Kiev, Ukraine, and uh, I grew up in uh, Soviet Ukraine until we immigrated to America uh, when I was 14. But what was it like growing up in Kiev? Very challenging. It was very restrictive environment. It, it was um, oppressive and uh, it wasn't a lot of things for for me to do and my parents always worked. So as, as a child with ADD, uh, my mom always threw me into activities. So to, to so start- ADD, uh, attention- Deficit, deficit disorder, really? yeah. When were you first like diagnosed with that? Uh, they don't really diagnose you. They just tell you, oh, she can't sit still, give her something to do. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. So you were a single child? Single child. Right. That's what was a norm. And uh, where I grew up was a norm to have a single- Interesting. Child, I, very few times it was two. Yeah, so I couldn't sit still and um, I didn't have siblings to keep me occupied. So when my parents worked a lot, it was an outlet for me. Um, so I, as long as, I, as long as I remember, I was always doing something. It started, I think, with ice skating. My mom put me in and that seemed to have not lasted as long as I would have liked. What was that? Because according to my mom, I was a mischievous child and I was eating ice off the floor. Off the ice rink? Off the ice rink, yeah. <laughs> she did tell me that if I didn't stop and quit, she would pull me out. And I didn't think she was serious. I did it right in front of her. And guess what? The next day I was out. That's how we always find our parents a series of us. Yeah, that's how I knew she that that was a serious right. thing. So after that, I did uh, join a swim club. Okay. And I did swim for a long time. Uh, I was groomed to swim for an, uh, an Olympic team uh, on the way to it. And it was a long swim days. We were practicing up for, I don't know, two up to four hours a day. Interesting. We had a huge pool and it was an outdoor. So even in winter, it was heated. Right. So right. you pop off, you know, you pop your head out and, and you would see just steam rising off. It was kind of cool. You know, yeah. they, they train everybody. So sure. like they put you in and if you excel and you are good right. at it, you move up to the next. guess what? You're in. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll train you harder. Right. But I didn't last long in swimming because, uh, drank the water. <laughs> 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 no, at this time I kept having eye infections. Oh, okay. so we couldn't figure out what it was. And my mom wanted to give me a break from swimming and the break turned into kind of a long prolonged break that I never went back. And then it was on to the next adventure. Right. Right. So the next was track which I did pretty good in, uh, in school. I was a sprinter and I did very good. I, I won like local school inter-class competitions and, uh, they saw talent in me. So they put me in a, a training for sprinting. So after that, uh, it became long cross country training, which I kind of dreaded. And I used to skip on that. Sometimes I used to goof and not show up and just walk around. Right. That's interesting you say that because a lot of track runners can't stand cross country. Yeah, because it's a long training. Like you're sure. talking about running for long distances, which we actually enjoy now. But before it, it wasn't, it's not fun for a kid. Right. And that's what I was going to say. The irony now is when we go over Yassi's exactly history of now over the last five, six years of what she's done. It's pretty amazing. So you were involved in track, and but you led a normal life as a kid in Pretty, pretty okay, as much right. as, it, as it was possible. It was interesting because I was the only child. I was expected to do things for the family. You were, had to help in whatever way you possibly can. So if, let's say, I was walking on the street from school home and I, I saw a line for some food or goods, I would have to get on it. It was my responsibility to find out what it was, mm -hmm. get online and get it because the goods were so rare and usually the things were so hard to get. But at the same time, you kept active with your athletics and it, you sounded very well-rounded, obviously. My parents tried to make sure that I was always busy doing something, right? you know, as much as possible. They didn't want me in the house because my parents could not, did not have anyone else to watch me. Yeah. And they kind of didn't want that to happen because you never know, you know, what's, 
what am I going to wander off into? Sure, sure. And I did wander off a few times because, you know, kids were with, you know, with friends and a lot of my friends were boys and I wandered off into construction sites and, but you kind of want to keep your kids busy doing things, which is the same thing as in America. You want to. And that's interesting. Kiev is a, it was a major city. Yes. I mean, equivalent of say, what would you equate to a new, uh, so it's, it's, it's funny that you say that actually Kiev is third major city. What? Well, was in former USSR, but in the entire USSR, in the entire USSR, but it was it's smaller than Brooklyn. Oh, okay. So yeah, I think our top population back then was like two plus million. Right. And I lived, I I grew up in the center of the city. That's still pretty impressive. Pretty impressive, right? Because I have friends who are from that part of the world, and they talk about the countryside. Yeah, a lot of countryside. Yes. yes. But you were more of the the inner city kind of girl. Inner city. Yeah. And sadly, too, you were apparently very close to Cherno- Chernobyl. Yes. And the nuclear accident that had yes. happened. Right. Yes. Uh, Kiev is only uh, about 80 kilometers south of Chernobyl. Right. And uh, when that whole situation happened, it, it kind of put major cracks into the whole uh, environment and uh, the oppressive regime that we lived in. People started to see things and notice things that the government wasn't honest about, um, that's very mildly put, sure. um, that we decide, people started to say. Right, so obviously in the West, we knew the dangers of it, but you live so close and yet you didn't know what- We the, didn't know, we were not were. informed at all about the actual Chernobyl disaster. Right. Um, who informed us, my grandmother lived here. So she actually called us international calls, which were also really difficult to, to do, international calls. And uh, in the middle of the night, and she said, do you know that two days ago, Chernobyl blew up? Wow. And uh, we were shocked to hear that from her. And after a while, actually the Russian government, the USSR government, they were pressured to release a statement to us when they said, don't worry, it's nothing serious. It's, it's just a minor accident. There was small radiation leak, which we know is a complete lie. It was actually was a huge disaster, a huge radiation leak. Yep. Yes. And um, we have a, a May Day celebration. It's International Workers' Day on oh, May right. 1st. May 1st. May sure. 1st, exactly. You're expected as a good citizen of, of good old Russia to go out and show your support for your amazing government. You go out for a parade. Every May 1st, there's a, a national parade. You go out, you either march in it mm-hmm. or you observe it. It's a must. Pretty much it's mandatory. Like you either march or you observe that you are me to go. So we were all out in the radiation as the radiation was, the cloud was swerving all, all over us. And that's when my parents decided, okay, we had enough. That was a turning Their point. Their life and yours. Yeah. That was a big eye opener for my mother. And she grew up believing that her, her government wanted the best for her. Mm-hmm. And she was really disenchanted. Right. At this point, she said uh, she, she was shell shocked and pretty much she couldn't believe that this was happening. And she said she had enough. So th- did they make a decision at that point? Like, yes, a, a few, right. So my grandmother lived here, my my, my paternal grandmother and um, in the United States, in the United States. Yeah, she lived in Brooklyn. Oh. And my dad once in a while was granted to visit her. You have to understand that going abroad was a big no-no. Like you had to go through these channels of getting a visa. It was just a lengthy process. And they have, they want to make sure that you're not escaping, that you're coming back. So they would hold things to make sure that you are coming back. Like you couldn't, he couldn't go with my mom or with me because that would mean that we're escaping. They're holding you. Right. You cannot escape. Right. You cannot escape this country because it's the greatest country in the world. How could you? So he came to visit her, and I think it was either a year or two after the Chernobyl, and he called my mom in the middle of the night because of the, the, the time difference. And he asked her, so we're leaving? And she was like half asleep, and she said, yeah, we are. Let's go. She didn't know where was, what was going on, so he kind of caught her off guard. Sure. But when she kind of agreed to it, they started the process. My, my grandmother started the process of leaving. What is the process like? It's not like you just... Book a flight. And yeah, it's not leave. like it is today because right. today, you know, uh, Ukraine is a freeish country, so you could kind of get up and go and right. do what you want. So it's a whole process where you basically submitting your papers that you are admitting that you are an enemy of the state. Uh, you are uh, 
guilty of crimes against high crimes against the state that you are basically becoming a bad person. Now all of a sudden you're going to be uprooted. How long? How long before you end up leaving? Between the process that the that the visa was started till we left, it was like mm, about two three years or so. Right, right. Uh, to to get us granted. Okay. A permission to leave. So you still had time to absorb all this. Yes. Think about it. I had it. time to let's Maybe say warn my change. friends. Yeah. 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 So ultimately you left. And what was ultimately that? Ultimately like? we left. It was exciting on one part because I think my parents and my mom especially, she made me feel like we're going somewhere better. Right. And to me as a kid, you know, oh okay, so it's not gonna be as bad as yeah. as I think it could be, even though I'm leaving everything I know behind, all my friends, I don't know where I'm going. Well, that was the thing. You could take anything with you. You couldn't take anything. You couldn't bring, could you you bring were, a suitcase? Yeah. So you were allowed a very limited amount of things to bring with you. Right. Um, you were also allowed to bring very limited amount of precious things. Um, we're talking like jewelry, gold, money. We knew there's going to be a lengthy process. The actual immigration was going to be a long, uh, and it would, a long process that would take a while. Right. So we knew that first we were going to Austria. So you didn't come right to the United States? No, you don't oh. go straight. Like you didn't go. We were one of the last waves to go this lengthy way because it was still um, the old USSR. And that's right. how they were doing things with them because there's the agreement I think they had. Okay. So in the, in the airport, which was, which was really interesting, that was my first, um, how do I explain it? Like the first, even though we grew up with the sense of that we... Nothing is really yours. You have very little property because everything kind of belongs to the state and we share everything. You know, I grew up in a commune apartment where we shared things as well. Right. You had two rooms we lived in, which was our apartment, but then you shared common areas. You shared the bathroom, the kitchen, like the hallway. Bathroom. Yeah, it was a kitchen. Wow. Yes, yes. Wow. Very, very hard to believe. It's hard to Coming believe. I, I still remember it so vividly. I could draw and I could draw yeah. a blueprint of it. Like I remember that vividly. Wow where everything was. So the first uh, idea of you taking my stuff came to me in an airport when we were leaving because the the people uh, you know that, that, that are making you go, they took our passports. They saw that we are leaving. They blacklisted us at this point. They said, you we're taking your passports where you're not allowed back. So now I think versus now when you're leaving Ukraine, you could you could just leave as a citizen and then come back whenever you right. you feel free. So now if I wanted to go back to Ukraine, I have to actually go as an American. If I wanted to stay there for a long amount, I have to apply for a visa. visa. Gotcha. Yeah. So when we were leaving, I remember them taking my passport and I had a passport at that point and my parents and in front of our eyes, they're like, OK, well, you're enemies of the state. We're taking away your passports. And they took away my parents work card which is it grants you permission to work. So if that's taken away from you, you're not allowed to work. But they allow you like three suitcase person, right? The suitcases, they opened it up in front of you and rummaged through it. Okay. You can't say, don't touch my stuff. Right. You can't say that. They could take out things that they deem that they want to keep or they deem that so they should had, not leave. If you had a book in there, favorite childhood book, and they took it, there's nothing you could do nothing about it. Nothing I could do. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I felt violated. Right. So you were probably happy to get, get away from this situation. Yeah, that was, yeah. I think that was like the last part right. before we left that kind of solidified, okay, I think I'm done. This is, this is not cool. I don't want to do this anymore. So you're in Austria for about a month and you have to go to a, a, an American embassy for an interview and, and they kind of go over like for uh, why do you want to leave? What prompted you to leave? Where are you looking to go? And mm -hmm. what do you think you're going to do? basic questions like that so that was the first stop so we were there about a month and the first time you get to austria we weren't in the center of it so we were in the outskirts of austria of vienna outside of vienna and we decided to go into the center of the city of vienna to walk around and look because we had a little time and i have to tell you that was a most surreal experience of my life because we've never been well, first of all, you're never allowed to go ab ab abroad. Right. But that was the first time I was abroad 
to and a city that was that's historical. That's got a it. huge historical background. Absolutely. And it's, uh, from what I've heard, it's gorgeous. It was. We were walking for hours. It was something out of like a, a fairy book. A what a rush. Book. What a rush. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, this, I think the first time we saw bananas. <laughs> we saw bananas with my mom and we were. What's that? We were like, is, is, what is this? Is this a banana? <laughs> we didn't have bananas. So that was kind of very interesting. That's so cute. Yeah. 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 It was definitely a shell shock. And mm -hmm. that's when we first tried haagen -Dazs. Went to the store. Really? Like, we, we didn't speak German. So we, yeah. so we were we were basically pointing, saying, mm, this. And we were trying to do English and point. And it kind of worked out because we oh, got one. Cute. It was delicious. <laughs> so you spent some time in Austria. And then uh -huh. did you come to the United States at that point? Or? No. So the next stop was Italy. Oh, okay. And you travel to Italy by train, and it was the outskirts of Rome, in a town called Ladispoli. That was the big hub, where you basic you 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 are there, waiting, a, a, an agree a, an arrangement to go into four countries. So you pick United States, Canada, Israel, or Australia. When you sign your, uh, you get. I don't, allowance to leave, you, mm -hmm. know, you write where you want to go. Oh, okay. So you have choices. But you're just waiting. Yeah. So also we heard that it, it could be, you know, you could have a, 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 your first choice denied and then you have to have a second choice. But there was an issue. So because there were so many people wanting to leave, they became overwhelmed and it was just too much pressure and strain on the resources. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't let us leave. And they base, they told us to that America was closed. Hmm. America closes doors. You're not you 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 have nowhere to go. You right. have to pick another choice. So my mom kind of went through this uh, emotional breakdown where where else are we gonna go? Yeah. You know we don't want to go to Australia. We don't want to go to Israel. You know we really have no one there. So the other option would have been to go to Canada and then travel down. Sure, sure. So while we were denied, of course we were also taken off the grant system. So there was no money coming in. Mm -hmm. So there was no money for housing or food. So we, we started to starve. Really? Yeah. We Seriously. went through a period where we were, we were stretched extremely thin, right. where my mom kind of used a lot of fillers and food, meaning she used grains in meat to make it look like there was more meat. Oh, wow. You know, then we you had to use like Russian food leftover that we brought with us and wasn't great tasting. We only ate maybe once, maybe twice. So as and much as Austria was kind of a unique fun experience, Italy was the reality. Of Italy was a reality. Italy. It sure. was it was a, a hard smack in the face. Right. Yeah. But eventually you did wind up in the United States. Yeah. So after a period of a few months, uh, the, I guess they rearranged things here with immigration and we were allowed to leave again. So we left finally on the plane. This time straight to New York, straight to JFK. Wow, that's great. So you came to the United States and you were like static, I bet. At first, I thought I was going to be, but you know, when you see the pictures of New York, you see Manhattan and high rises yeah. and all this cool, fun stuff, like the center of right. the world. We got to Brooklyn and we're coming from greenest city that we grew up in Kiev. It's very green. There's parks everywhere. Right. To go to a concrete jungle of just brick houses. They all look the same. Right, yeah. They all two floors. Cookie cutter type of things. Very. My parents were both engineers, different oh. times, but they were both engineers. Right. So they were to eventually, I guess, get work here. Yes. Things like that. Yes. Which actually, funny that you say that both of my parents be were engineers uh, with a high education. The when they came here, they had to start at the bottom. Right. And That's... you're talking like in their forties, start from the bottom. Like my mom was a volunteer at first. Um, and my dad worked in the hospital maintenance. Gotcha. So you settled into Brooklyn and you wound up going to high school here, obviously. Yeah. So now you're here in the United States and that's where you met Peter, your husband. Yes, my husband, Peter. Right. Yeah, I met him in high school. So we're high school sweethearts and we started dating in high school and we just stood together, you know, right. through thick and thin. Well, that's a great story coming here, you know, and obviously we've become such good friends and it. It's such an honor to you know, meet somebody with such a, an amazing past, you know, and you're just one of us New Yorkers now, which is tremendous. Yes, thank you, Mark. Funny that you mentioned that. We got our citizenship. Uh, it was in a 1992, I believe, and it was the best day of my life. And I brought Peter with me because we were dating a few years and 
I was so excited with him to share that. It right. was finally a part, I become a citizen of a country that wants me here. Like it, right. it had such a deep meaning to me in this, it, I'm still getting goosebumps. Oh, oh. It's, it's a deep meaning, a country that wants me here that allowed me to come here with absolutely nothing. Yeah. And it wanted, you know, it allowed me to grow right. and prosper. Yeah. And you were probably at a good age when you came here. Yeah, it was 14. You know, 14. So yeah, it took us nine months of right. immigration. And the world is still your oyster at that yep. age. And you and Pete eventually get married. Yes. Yeah, so we get married and uh, we, we decide to not have children at first. We decide to just enjoy life and travel and do things. And that's how I got into fitness when we got married. Oh, so what kind of fitness did you get into at that point? So it was funny that um, when we got married, we both started eating like crazy. So we were eating all this unhealthy things, really, and we both put on a little bit of weight. So we decided to join the gym and start lifting weights. Right. We were lifting weights, and I actually fell in love with the way that made me feel. And I wanted to help people who were struggling with the same issues that I was. Just basic life, you know, eating, not being active, and just gaining weight. Right. So I, des we des I decided to become a personal trainer really? at that point. Yes. You certified to become a personal trainer? Personal trainer, certified personal wow. trainer. And I started working in different jobs. Like I started moving up um, professionally. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a great job that I got in downtown Brooklyn where I met great people. And I started seeing, you know, very fit, muscular women that were doing fitness competitions. So I wanted to try that. So that's how I got into my first serious fitness, which was bodybuilding. Female figure competitor. Which oh, that's is, the technical term. That's the technical term. I like term. that. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I did that for a few years and right. it was a, a little restrictive. It got to, like, I, I became a little bit disenchanted with it because I, I got to compete at the national level where it became harder and harder and it became more of a, a, a part-time job. Like I had to dedicate a lot of time, a lot of, right. to working out and then to dieting, prepping my meals and everything. Sure, sure. So we wanted to yeah. have kids and it sure. was around at the same time we decided, listen, it's, it's been a while. We should probably start having kids. Right. And I didn't want to fall into uh, the bracket of where a female bodybuilders have issues of, of, of getting pregnant and, and having children. So Is that I, I want possible hormonal changes for me. It's possible. Yes. Like yeah. Very restrictive dieting and okay. you're always watching and your body fat goes so low that right. it doesn't number on, on your, um, on your body and your biochemistry. Sure. So I didn't want to push my body anymore. I get pregnant and we have Dylan. Awesome. Yes, Dylan turned my world upside down. Yes, because I, I went from from being so active, you know, working, I am working out, and now I have a baby, and all I do is baby. <laughs> oh my god! Never heard a term that way, but that's all very I do cool. is baby, all and it was baby. just it was hard. It was hard, and it was hard to balance. How do I balance being a mom? being a, like a good mom. Mm -hmm. I want to be active as well for my child. I want to be active also outside of being a mom. I want to do stuff that kind of like doing, you know, right. I do remember that when well, I remember lifting weights, that was fun. You know, I remember looking good. That was fun too. Mm -hmm. Like I want to kind of do it without all the restrictions, but kind of do that on the side. And it became a challenge. Right. So I went back to the gym and there was the gym that I was a, a member of was great. They always had like little races going on and they put on this charity race. It was for, for autism and I wanted to participate in it. And it was a, something like a, in the three, like a, it was either a 5k or a four miler. And it was around the neighborhood. It was, you left from the gym, which fourth Avenue, you run down to the promenade, you run along the water, make a user and come back. So very sure. easy, simple, nothing complicated. I just figured I could do that. Great. So I kind of trained for it a little bit. Like I ran with friends just to kind of get my running back up to speed. And um, my first race, I think Dylan was about one. And it was in Torrencio, down four. Isn't that the way? I remember my first race, the same way. I think all runners had that experience. Isn't that, that's the way. I think it's just basically an initiation. Sure. If you can make it through this, then you either love it or you hate it. Right, right. Well, that's a good segue into kind of the running part of your life. Yeah. So you run this in this different run, just downpour, but at the same time, you said, yeah, I kind of like this. I kind of like this. Yeah. I have to tell you, running, when I turn around and running back, I'm thinking, thank God I'm running back. Right. 
But I did already have run halfway. Sure. Soaking wet. But it's fun. But how could it be fun when you're wet? So you, you come to your brain, like you talk to yourself. It's like <laughs> the most interesting thoughts you have while you're sure. running, right? Sure. That was the start. That's when you came to Staten Island. Yes. Right? Yes. I didn't want to go. Peter wanted to go because he said, you get the best bank for your money. Best bank for your buck, right? As far as buying a house? or. Buying Pro property. property. So you own, we, we owned an apartment in Brooklyn and it was tiny. It was one bedroom and three of us lived in one bedroom. It was right. tight. It was like 600 square feet. It was tight. And Peter wanted to have more kids. And I was like, yeah, we probably should have more kids. Yeah, I guess that's right. You got more children in the space. So. Yes, you could make it work. I mean, I did come from, from uh, Soviet Russia, that's so true. I could make it work. <laughs> you know, there's there's way to work around it. I right, mean, right. we lived in one bedroom, a commune apartment. I could make it work here. Sure. But Peter was having none of that. Yeah. And so we moved to South Shore in Eltingville because that's where Peter's family was. And we wanted to move to the area with good school system where, you know, yeah. the schools were good. Because if we're going to have kids, I want my kids to go to good school. So like any good parents, you research the area, the schools, yes. the facilities and things like that. So you settle in. You have Dylan. How old's Dylan at this point? Now? I think Dylan is about three. Right. So there's a little gap there. A little gap. Yeah. yeah and then you years. get pregnant, you have Olivia, your second child. Yes. Right. Okay. And um, you were saying that after Olivia, you wanted to get back into running again. I really got into running. I'm going to make you laugh because my diet consisted of Cinnabons <laughs> with Olivia. Nothing wrong with that. No, that's why she's so sweet. Nutrition. I have to tell you, it was, it was one of those things, but I would tell Peter, Peter, you got to go get a Cinnabon. You just got to go get a Cinnabon. And I just lived, I think, a Cinnabon a week or so. Right. And, uh, you know, that's not really the greatest diet. Yeah. And after Olivia was born, I'm also a lot older now. So I am 36 and it's kind of harder to lose weight now. You know, it's, I don't have a 20 year old body. It's, it's tougher. Sure. Yeah, right. So now I have Olivia. I have two kids. You know, Peter works a lot and it's my job to make sure that the kids are good. The house is good. And try to drop a little bit of weight. And I was like, I found it a little difficult to juggle time. Sure. To find time for myself. The first thing I picked was my friends that I worked in Manhattan with. They were, we're all on Facebook now. They're all doing Spartans. Spartan races is the thing to do. And that's looks so cool. You run, you're in the woods, God knows where. And you're like doing cool obstacles where you have to like log a piece of weight around. I almost felt like a caveman. Like I wanted to do that stuff. So you did Spartans. That's an interesting jump from just say doing a 5k. Right. And I started running at 2013 and I had a really few good races, like a good chunk of them, 5k's, 10k's. I had, I had a, like a, a good a chunk of halves where I did really good. And I figured, well, let me just throw in myself, um, like my name for a lotto for New York. Maybe I'll get in. If I get in, then it's meant to be. Right. And guess what? I got in. I was so, the same experience back in 1991. <laughs> Show my age a little bit. But when I got in, I was shocked. I was like, because they told you how hard it was. And I was like, wow, I really got to train for that. So is that the kind yes. of feeling you had? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it was a little overwhelming looking the first time I looked and I go by Hal Higdon program because I right. love they're so simple and there's yeah. so many variations. You could just pick whatever you want. So I picked something that would work and uh, yeah, it was challenging to run that strict. Like you had to run that strict and that much. Like right. the first time I broke, I think, 15 miles, that was a huge milestone for me. Sure. Yeah. So did you train with people or were you training by yourself? I wasn't a member of any clubs sure. because I think it comes from the point, the fact that I was an only child and that was a lot by myself when growing up. I just do things by myself. So how'd you do in your first New York marathon? I, I programmed my body, you know, to, to run from about like 10, 30 minute pace till up to like 10, 45. And I did a 10, 30 pace. I did a four hours, 28 minutes, Fantastic. which was huge for me. Absolutely. I, I was so proud that I made it. Right. Right. What was the next one in 2017? So 2017, I, after the New York, you know, you, you come home and you're all high. Sure. Sure. I'm high on marathon. I want to do another one. Right. Without thinking there was a lot of for Chicago. And I figured, oh, Peter, so we're going to Chicago. Like, if we go to Chicago, that's not far, right? We could, like, drive. <laughs> that's true. Whatever. You're not really familiar with. No, not at all. Geography, I never go United out States. really of tri-state area. Right. So I'm thinking, you know, Chicago would be cool, you know, to go. I put in my lane for the lotto, and guess what? I got into Chicago. You're lucky So 
Chicago we go to next year. What a fun experience. We made it a, a family trip, and I, that's what I try to do now. I right. try to make all my destination races, sure. make sure I include the family. One of, I want my kids to see the world, what I couldn't see. I want them to see things that I kind of could not. That's great. Yeah. I love that. We loved Chicago. Mm -hmm. What a great experience. First of all, the race itself was great. It was nice and flat. That's what I heard. I heard <laughs> Nothing crazy flat. like New York. Sure. Totally good PR on that. I did like four hours, five <laughs> minutes. Thank Fair you. Enough. And I was like on fire. Right. But that was also the year that I decided that I wanted to challenge myself to do something different that I would not think of doing, which was triathlons. So my first triathlon I signed up was a Staten Island Tri. Well, first one was the pancake one, which is almost the same course, except you go in a opposite direction. That's the one in Midland Beach, right? Midland right. Beach. So you so you you go um, the other way. So you go like counterclockwise and Staten Island Triathlon is a different organization, but you go clockwise. Okay. Yeah. So it's the same course, mm -hmm. but pancake, flat as a pancake, which was great because they give you pancakes at the end. <laughs> I loved it. I still have the shirt. Yeah. Unfortunately, they don't do the race anymore. So maybe yeah. they'll come back one time. And that's what going back to Ukraine, your swimming experience kind of kicked in a little bit, right? You have to remember, I haven't swam since then. Interesting. Till now. Yeah. So I haven't swam for 30 years. That's amazing. I have to get my head in the water now. Yeah. What a total freak out. <laughs> I didn't expect that to be my total freak out. Right. Yes. Right. So you jump in the, how long was the swim? So the swim for the triathlon in Staten Island was quarter mile. Okay. So what was after that? I saw a friend of mine, I post on Facebook that he jumped off a ferry to swim. And I thought that was completely outrageous. And of course, wow. I, my big supporter, my biggest supporter, Peter, I showed it to him and he's like, this is crazy. Why, why would anybody want to Where do was that? This? So this is in Cape May. Oh, down in New Jersey. Sure. But then I showed it to him that it's in Cape May, which we absolutely love. So then he, Peter tells me, you have to do it because right. it's Cape May. We're going to take the kids, just jump the ferry. What's the big deal? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we decide that, uh, yeah, oh, maybe. How was it? It was 14 feet, but trust me, when we got to the edge, it's, I swear, like it felt 140 like, feet. Yeah it, it, yeah, it felt like forever, an eternity yeah. dropping down. Oh, that's fantastic. That was very unique. Yeah. And I can't say I want to do it again. Right. Yeah, but I did it. Right, exactly. It was done. Many people can't say that. Yes. The day before, my son did that, the swim with me, would he have to jump off it too? Oh, but, my son did it too. Yeah. The just day before swim, was right? just the swim. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he swam with me. So, what was the next progression? Well, look, how do we top that? <laughs> well, there's a half Iron Man. Oh. oh my God, I never thought. And you know who my inspiration was for the, for the Ironman? My great running partner, Chris. Chris Kalamana. Chris Kalamana, who, 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 exactly, sure. who we all know and love. And yeah. I thought like, oh my God, that, this man challenges himself constantly. I said, what if I could just do a little bit? Like I will try to do a, a, an Ironman because the thought of like swimming a mile, I'm sorry, it was more than a mile, 1.2 miles. That's crazy. You bike 53 miles, 56 miles, I'm sorry. And then you run a half marathon after that. Like to me, like I could run a half marathon, but not after doing all that stuff consecutively after the other. And I thought, what a great challenge. I could do that. But let me do the flat one. Just to make sure that I could kind of do it sure. and flat's kind of good. I could challenge myself, but knowing that I have some kind of platform where I feel a little safety, right, right. which was flat. So I picked Atlantic City. And, um, of course on that day we wake up and there's a torrential downpour hurricane again. So why no. not? Why not go to a torrential sure. downpour? Go for it. Of course. Exactly. We survived that. It was that, pretty good. And that's your, your half iron. So I was a half iron at that point. Right. But why stop there? So this is the, the mother of all races. The right? mother of all races. I think yeah. this was, this was my, the iron cup that. Right. that I really wanted to, to, to get to. So tell us a little bit about Mont Blanc. Am I saying it? Mont Blanc, Canada. Okay. Canada, yes. We picked Canada because I Let's saw the that. video <laughs> of people finishing right. an Ironman in Mont Blanc, And I, it was magical. It was almost out of worldly fairy tale experience. And I, th and, I, and I thought to myself, I'm going to do this. Right. And Another I showed it to Peter. Yeah. I showed Peter like the whole video of the village and the scenery I, and it was the most beautiful magical place right so this is the shirt you actually got so this is the shirt so that i got audience. yes this is the shirt that i got 
from there. Yes. So in the Ironman race, you swim 2.4 miles mm -hmm. and you swim in the beautiful Lac Treblant. And it is um, fresh water, very deep, but very long, narrow lake that keeps going for miles. I don't even know where it ends. 2.4 miles. And there was one loop. Like you swim 1.2 miles out, you make a turn, and then you swim 1.2 miles back. Right. So you're in the water constantly. Yeah, so it's, it's nice and relaxing being in the water. Right. But not when you get out of the water because then you're all discombobulated. You transition to bike. Mm -hmm. Um, that's 116 miles of, of cycling through mountainous terrain. Why well, pick a flat race at this point? At this point, I've done well, flat. You've done flat. I've done flat. It's time to move up. Why not move up, you know, <laughs> with, with the, and play with the big boys? You know, now we got mountains. We yeah. got Laurentius Mountains, and those are no joke. Right, right. You know, they're long, long, tedious climbs, and the scents are great, but the tedious climbs. I was going to say, the scents are the reward. The re that's sure. the best part about right. mountain. But you got to like change. Like, oh. Yes. Well, maybe not exactly that. Yeah. You kind of want to, you know, yeah. that trip. And after that, you run a full marathon. Yeah. That's the amazing part. Because I've done a couple smaller ones and the transition off the bike, I thought, oh, this is my sport. I'm a runner. No way. Your legs become like two bricks. Did you have that experience? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That was not fun. As a runner, I have to tell you the same thing. When I got to running, I was crushed. There was no running happening. Sure. It was just everything that went good with the swimming and biking, everything fell apart in running. There was no running. And I went through the same experience and I thought that was so unique because I thought this is my strength and beat the crap out of me. No, yes. At that point, it becomes a, almost like a survival. Yes. You just know you have to keep it. It is. It's exactly yes. that. They give you cutoff points, which is kind of makes it puts you under pressure to finish. Like right. You you have 17 hours to finish the whole race, but you have cutoff points for swim, bike, and oh, run. Right, right. So if you don't make those, you're out of the race. You get disqualified. Wow. Yeah. So when I got off the bike, I was so happy that I made the cutoff time. I made under it. Yeah. And I did the first loop of so called running. <laughs> and I see my family there. This is the first time in my life when I said, I quit. Really? And I told them, I quit. I can't do this. I was in tremendous pain and I could not just, everything that was wrong was wrong. My legs weren't working. I had stomach pain. I had cramps so bad. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't even breathe right. to wow. run. It got I mean, possible health issues. Yeah. It, I didn't know what was happening and I didn't want to stop. And I kind of didn't want to know, like, I didn't want medics to tell me you probably yeah. should quit. And I was like, I'm not quitting. Right, right, right. But I didn't want to know that. So I was like, if it's quit on my own, I quit on my own. And my family seeing them at that beginning of second loop, and they told me, you made one loop. There's one more loop to go. You got, you, you, like you can do it. Like you, basically they made me finish it. Yeah. That's the beauty of family. They can inspire you. They did inspire me. Right. They did. And you finished under the 17, obviously. I actually finished under 16. I finished like huh. 15 hours and like 20 minutes. And finishing under 16 hours, it was huge for me. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. How did you top that? Well, I came home and there was a Grand Fonda going on in Jersey. And I said, well, I already did 100 miles, so I could do so a Grand Fonda. That's what a Grand Fonda is, 100 miles? Grand Fonda. I signed up those different levels and I signed up for 100. The 100 miles. How long did that take? Um, you know, Grand Fonda was great because you don't have to treat it like a race. Right. And I didn't treat that like a race. Take breaks. And you take breaks. Take it didn't take me long. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah. But the food stations were amazing. I would right. definitely recommend Grand Fonda's. <laughs> And then I decided, I signed up for a, a 60K New York Roadrunner race, and I finished that. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's an amazing, amazing running history in a relatively short period of time, you know? Yes, yeah, pretty short. It hasn't been to 10 years yet. Right, right. You and I are both training for the virtual Boston Marathon. Yes. Yes, we are. Which Yasha has this great knack for getting, talking me into doing things and then going, okay, we really have to do this. But we have started our training process, and I'm really looking forward to that. And some of our runs that we've done, we've actually started a little group called the Urban Discovery Project. Yes, we did. Right. Oh my God, Mark, the things that we love about Staten Island. So when I moved to Staten Island, people used to tell me in Brooklyn, my friends, you would not last there. You would hate it. Right. Uh, well, let me tell you something. I fell in love with Staten Island. People don't know Staten Island how we do. Right. You have the most amazing borough. It's full of parks and discovery history. And that's how we discovered things on our runs. Sure, sure. 
We talk about history a lot, yeah, right? Yeah, we've discovered some old buildings from 100 years ago that remains are still there. Absolutely. We become a brick collector. We become brick collectors. Right, we collect fun antique bricks. bricks. Absolutely. Yeah. Any goals for the future since you've had such a history? I always have goals, but I really don't know where it would take me. I would love to run a few marathons, a few more probably destination races. Right. I would like to include my kids. Like we're big in history. We are big into history. Okay. So a historical races would be great. Another Ironman. I always get asked, like, do you gonna do another Ironman? I would love to. It's it puts a strain on the family a, a, a little bit. So maybe I would have to wait till my kids are a little older. Sure. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Yasia. It was just very enlightening. I think we gave everybody a little history lesson as well, which is always fun. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Mark. That was fun.